Thank you. Marcel Mule passed down uh, this playing style through, through performances, through recordings, but also through his writings and the method books that he authored. Um, yet it's it very remarkable how little he actually wrote about his own vibrato, considering that many people consider this one of his prominent features. According to Eugene Rousseau, who studied briefly with Marcel Mule, Mule would instruct his students to practice vibrato at 288 pulses per second. I'm sorry, 288 pulses per minute. <laughs> which turns out to be 4.8 pulses per second. Um, this is also the exact rate if you go four oscillations of vibrato per beat if you set the metronome on 72. This is precisely why in Mule's edition of Fairling's famous 48 studies, all the slow movements are marked at 72 beats a minute. But uh, Mule apparently didn't write and didn't talk very much about the vibrato width, uh, but claimed it should be left up to the individual's tastes and interpretations. This notion that vibrato should be basically just left up to the individual is actually fairly common among most saxophone methods that were authored over the last 90 years, ever since we've been talking about vibrato, really ever since Rudy Weedoff wrote about it in a positive way. Uh, many of these methods include instructions on how to achieve different types of vibrato using your jaw, using your lips, using your throat, diaphragm, etc. Many of them actually give specific parameters how wide they think it should be, how fast they think it should be. But rarely is there actually a discussion on the history of vibrato or how it got to the saxophone or the justification for the use of vibrato on the saxophone. Uh, one book that actually does discuss a few of these things and, and I think has maybe the best discussion on vibrato is Larry Till's landmark uh, saxophone method book, The Art of Saxophone Playing, which he authored in 1963. Uh, Larry Till begins his uh, section on vibrato in his book uh, talking about vibrato being a controversial subject. And this is possibly because he knows anything he's going to say about vibrato. He's opening himself up toward, to criticism because there's not much of, a, of, a, of an established discourse on vibrato during this time period. He does call it a natural consequence of emotion or expression uh, relating to maybe being a natural phenomenon. Later, he directly relates it to the human voice. Here's what Larry Teal says in the middle of his work about a section. The saxophone is essentially a lyric instrument whose tone and use is associated with the human voice. Inasmuch as vibrato is universally accepted as a natural embellishment for the voice, it is logical that the saxophone should be treated likewise. A lot of good things here. We have him talking about vibrato being natural, and he definitely gives a justification for the use of vibrato on the saxophone. Yet he really doesn't mention specific parameters, and he doesn't talk about if the vibrato that vocalists use, that he calls universally accepted, he doesn't mention or discuss if this is in fact natural or if this is something else. He also doesn't really discuss if the, the vibrato vocalist use or other instrumentalists use is in fact used as an embellishment or if it's maybe something different, maybe what others consider a little more part of the fundamental sound. Teal finishes the section in his book on vibrato, like many other saxophone methods, by saying that whatever kind of vibrato you use, make sure you just use it in the very best musical tastes. So again, if there really is an established discourse on saxophone vibrato, it basically is this should be left up to the individual and use your, use your musical taste that you've developed as a musician. But I would maybe argue that aren't our tastes severely affected by the environment around us? Is it, isn't it possible that all the numerous re recordings and live performances we listen to, aren't we shaped by those and don't we copy uh, what we hear a little bit? Uh, yes. It is, it is impossible to find two saxophones who play vibrato exactly the same way. Yet, we can also see larger trends in the use of vibrato which prove uh, there's something different going on. For instance, uh, time period in the middle of the 20th century, generally vibrato use was quite a bit heavier than what we hear with modern classical saxophonists. We can also see this regionally. The French saxophone school or even the European saxophone school generally uses vibrato in a quite a bit different way than the American saxophone school. So this is absolutely proof 
that contemporary fashions are as strong, if not stronger, on how we play as our own original ideas. So again, I suggest we turn back to history, maybe to, to find a different and a new and alternative approach. Before uh, laying out what I consider the historical approach to Saxon vibrato, let's first re-examine uh, what the actual purpose of vibrato is. Uh, I've looked around uh, to many music dictionaries, music encyclopedias, there's several different definitions of what vibrato actually is. But uh, the one from musicologist Frederick Norman is actually my favorite. It's a very straightforward definition. He says vibrato is a means of enriching musical tone by rapid, regular oscillations of pitch, loudness, or timbre, or by a combination of these. Well, recent studies have shown that the perceived enrichment in tone color that comes from the vibrato comes from, as these different uh, parameters modulate, it changes the upper harmonic series and causes, causes it to shift, which enriches the actual tone quality. Yet, these, uh, these oscillations can only be so wide, or the harmonics begin to overlap, and we start we start hearing it, we start hearing distortion, we start hearing unpleasantness in the vibrato. Or even worse, we, we start hearing the vibrato as literally changes in pitch and not as just an enrichment of tone. Uh, many different numbers have been thrown out about what this actual threshold is for how large vibrato can actually be. But it seems that uh, it's directly tied to the speed of the vibrato. If you're, if you're using very fast vibrato, as much as eight per second, which is very fast, although some vocalists have been known to use the vibrato this fast, uh, it may be as high as, a, as nearly a half step, which it seems very wide, but as, as you go faster, the, the, the physics change. But if you use vibrato that's, that's slower, more in line with what modern instrumentalists use, which is generally around five per second, some have suggested that maybe the threshold for truly hearing vibrato is simply an enrichment of tone is actually only really about 20 cents, which as we've seen what Marcel Mule used is way less than, than, than what he did. Uh, Carl Seashore, in, the, in his landmark studies of vibrato, which is one of the first to, to really, really study vibrato in depth in the 1930s, he suggested that maybe the best vibrato of all is when listeners perceive the sound is really only a manipulation of timbre with no changing of the pitch. I believe it is um, important to understand the science behind vibrato if you want to develop any kind of approach to it because you must be able to recognize how much and what kind of tonal deviation is appropriate. Um, uh, from a historical standpoint, we have a uh, there's so many accounts of, sac of, excuse me, of vibrato being a natural phenomenon in the human voice that uh, this is especially important if we're going to develop this, this historical approach to pay attention to vocal vibrato. It's, it's even more important for saxophonists because really the voice and the saxophone's tone are, are closest than any other instrument with the, with the concentration of harmonics around 2000 hertz. Uh, therefore, any kind of vibrato on saxophone will come off or be perceived by the listener as in a similar way to vocal vibrato. Therefore, for uh, any kind of development of a historical approach to vibrato, we need to develop first and maybe a, a natural continuous vibrato. Uh, the rate of this vibrato maybe is in question, but through my own playing, when we talked about the muscular tremors, tremors like from the brain joint happening between five and eight times per second, so the natural vibrato is generally between five and eight pulses per second. Yet I, I have found in my own playing that eight per second is very, very fast, even seven. Six feels better, five feels pretty good. So therefore, if you're going to play, play vibrato in close to five per second, you wanna have this more natural, subtle vibrato, you really need to limit it at 20 cents or less in the pitch uh, variation. Uh, since, so, so I'm not just throwing out these random numbers. Uh, here's, a, here's a recording of an of a electronically generated triangle wave uh, playing some vibrato. First, let's listen to, just so you can hear what it sounds like, 
This is using, this is Virata on the triangle wave at 70, a deviation of 70 cents, uh, fairly along the lines of what Mule was playing. Sounds like this. So there we can absolutely hear pitch moving up and down. I think most will agree. This is what I would consider more of the natural rattle, the 20 cent deviation at five cycles per second. So through, through my own practice, I've tried to develop a vibrato that's close to this. So you don't necessarily hear the pitch going up and down so much, but you, you hear of absolutely a fluctuation. And this maybe is closer to what the human voice actually uh, does naturally. There's also references in, in, his, in the historical treatises and writings to maybe a natural vibrato is actually more of a, a variation of timbre, not pitch. So to try to develop this kind of playing, uh, I've, I've experimented with varying the air pressure in my mouth a bit uh, and get a, get a little bit of uh, the intensity or timbre vibrato. This is essentially diaphragm vibrato, but I like to think of it as, as just varying the air pressure in your mouth because that helps to keep these uh, variations slight. The historical approach of vibrato would be to reserve any kind of more exaggerated or intentional vibrato for special places in the music, hence using it as ornamentation. Um, and also, if you reserve a vibrato for special places, when you do use it, it has a more dramatic effect in my opinion. Often, uh, these concepts of ornamental and natural vibrato are again tied to historically accurate, historically performed, uh, historically informed performances. But I ask, why can't you use these uh, for, for music from any era? I mean, if, if vibrato truly is natural, then it always has been natural and always will be natural. And even though the role of music has changed drastically in our society, the perception of emotion, I think, is one of the more universal qualities of music. And if vibrato is one of the main um, ways to convey emotion, then we, there's no reason why we should use a fundamentally different vibrato style from uh, music of any era. Uh, lastly, the use of vibrato in forms of pre-modern music or modern music often actually has to do more with practicality than simply tradition. When you play Renaissance music, you don't tone down your vibrato or use almost no vibrato simply because that's the tradition of Renaissance music. You do it because the music is in general lighter and, and things like that, what the actual music sounds like. So, so I would argue that this, this more historical approach to vibrato actually may help us serve the music better and get beyond simply performing using a, informed by our own personal tastes. Therefore, this brings us to, to our last piece. Uh, we're going to perform Debussy's uh, Rhapsody for Saxophone. And uh, I'm going to try to demonstrate some of these concepts of maybe a subtle use of an ornamental vibrato, a uh, more continuous use of uh, what I'm working on as natural vibrato. And uh, I want to thank you guys all for coming out tonight. I want to thank Ksenia for perf uh, performing on the recital and preparing this music. And uh, without further ado, here is the Debussy's Rhapsody for Saxophone.